Discussion keeps the world turning. This is Roundtable. You're listening to Roundtable. I'm Yo Hong Ling, joined by Josh Cotterell and Ding Hong. Coming up on the second half of the show, if you live in China, you might have already noticed this. Everyone, from your hairdresser to your tech support, is called a teacher nowadays. It's not just a quirky trend; it has deep roots in our history and evolving social norms. Today, let's unravel the fascinating journey of the word "teacher." Explore how it has morphed into a universal term of respect, and what this says about the Chinese society. Also, have you heard about the latest trend in Beijing? Medicinal bread. That's right. Bakeries are popping up with health-focused loaves featuring ingredients from traditional Chinese medicine. Imagine grabbing a loaf with goji berries or ginseng. Is it a gimmick or a delicious way to boost your health? Tell us what you think. But now, in a world where titles often define our interactions, the term teacher has become remarkably ubiquitous. It's fascinating to consider how this once exclusive designation has permeated various professions, reflecting a broader shift in our societal values. From the savvy businessman to the local noodle chef, it's old Tony 老师 or Teacher Emily. It's like a linguistic quirk straight out of a comedy sketch, but the truth behind this cultural peculiarity is far from a joke. So, is it really that common? I want to start by asking you: Have you ever been called a 老师 before? I'm pretty sure you have. So, when is the first time, Ding Hong? Ah.、Uh... Maybe ten years ago. Ten years ago, you were. That was only one、ready. year into <laughs> my career after I graduated from college. Ah,、uh, so from a student to a teacher, right? Yeah, right yeah, like that. yeah. So it was not called by a colleague of mine. I think it was、uh, someone I worked with that is outside our company.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, probably this is a Chinese-only culture. Yeah, if you don't know how to address a person, especially a professional, just call him or her. Teacher or 老师 in Chinese, and if you know what he does exactly, you can also call him as a teacher. And you don't even need to know his name; just call him teacher, and <laughs> that's everything. Because this title is not gender specific, right?、Mm-hmm. So basically, everybody, especially professional ones, can be called teacher in China. This is very interesting. I want to ask Josh because we know you speak a little bit of Chinese. I am belittle your ability. You speak Chinese to your other Chinese friends, not on the show for sure. But do you experience similar situations? Do people call you Josh 老师 Um. Yeah. I mean, this is. I probably say 老师 and hear 老师 over a hundred <laughs> times a day. I think. Uh, I I think it's I don't say any word more than this.、I'll、probably say it. <laughs> really?、Uh, maybe maybe I say xie xie the most, but、uh, <laughs> I think yeah. After that, it'd probably be lao shi. And one of the reasons is because, as Ding Hong rightly mentioned, it's it's not gender specific, and also it's not really、um, professionally specific. As in, you can、uh, use this in most professions, right?、Um, and it's quite a polite way to use it. So I definitely overuse it, and I hear it all the time. But.、Um, It saved me on many occasions because, you know, when I hear Chinese names, a lot of them I, I find them very difficult to retain in my memory、um, because some of them sound the same. A lot of them are the same, or they have a similar character or sounding word in them, and so it's more difficult for me to remember them. But I can always go back to Lausche, so this is why I.、Uh... Use it so much. Well, I am going to share、um, some of my standards when I decide whether or not to address the other party, 老师 But you, you guys are welcome to jump in any time because my nuance is quite specific to start with. When it comes to the term 老师 or teacher in Chinese, the reason we address people as 老师 is because when we were kids, actually, we would call our teachers. Actually, we call them some some teacher, and the some some would be their. Family name, so Zhang 老师李老师王老师 So these are actual teachers. When we grow up, and they teach us things, we pay respect to them. And I feel like that 
is one of the reasons that I find it okay to call people 老师 in a workplace because I feel like they can always teach me one thing or two, and it's justified. And when I do that to start with, I would like to prefer calling them 老师 with their family name to show that I still remember who they are. I remember their family name. That's why my first standard. And if I really don't remember the name, I would just say 老师 But I feel a little bit guilty when I do that. And the second thing is for me, I would still call those with a certain profession 老师 So I don't address my, for example. Hair stylist, 老师 I don't really do that. And、uh, for example, for my taxi driver, I might call them 师傅 I don't call them 老师 So that's my nuance. That's the standard I stick up to.、Mm, I very much resonates with that actually. You know, because you can always find disagreements in the comment area whenever you check online articles about this particular topic on the internet, and the reason why they disagree to. Abuse this term or this title is mostly because they believe calling everybody 老师 or teacher will blur this address for real teachers and will damage the kind of respect that real teachers deserve for their career for real teachers. So for people who behave really in a bad manner. Or unprofessional manner, they don't really deserve this title, 老师 For me, I only address people that I genuinely respect for their professionalism as teacher or 老师 I have a pretty high standard, I would say. I call a person 老师 not necessarily because he or she is my boss or has worked for a longer time period than I have. This person must have some qualities that I think are precious, valuable, and really deserve my respect. I am really against abusing this particular title, 老师 To me, this title is still a little bit sacred. If this is a person that on your mind you don't have respect for at all, or you even look down upon, why call him 老师 Calling him or her as a teacher. Is mentally uncomfortable to me. Wow, I feel like you have stricter rules than I do. And one last principle for me is that because sometimes when people a little bit older than I am, senior than I am from another company, start calling me 老师 I get really uncomfortable. I feel like I do not deserve that, and that is the reason <laughs> that I don't do that to. Like peers or colleagues with similar age, if we know each other enough, I mean, from the very beginning, you might address them as 老师 But for those who are definitely younger than I am, or for the interns that we're working together, I don't do that to them because I feel maybe they will feel uncomfortable as well. So that's my last standard. That is, I don't do that to people who are definitely not. That senior or within that age group to my standard, but I was actually curious because this 老师 thing now feels like a very common, very universal thing in China. I was wondering what's the situation in the Western world. Is there a phrase or a way of addressing people that you guys would very much like to use in a professional setting? Yeah, there are, but I don't think that there's anything. Like this,、um, if you wanted to be really respectful, then you could call someone "sir,"、um, usually a, a male, and "madam" for a female. But this is usually for customer service contexts, or、ah. in the United Kingdom, if you're in high school or secondary school,、uh, you would call your teacher "sir" or "miss."、Um, at least that's what I did,、um, and so you would only call. You wouldn't use the word "teacher." Um, you might use the word professor, but actually, that's more of an Americanism or a, an American English sort of thing. Even at university in the United Kingdom, we would call our professors by their first name. Usually,、uh, actually, after the age of sixteen, you call all of your teachers by their first name, not、mm. even by their last name. So, I, I think there's quite a big difference here, and there's there's less of a generalized term, but. For me, I actually see Laosha. I do believe that it is overused sometimes, but I know that I obviously translate it directly in my brain as a native English speaker. So I think that for me, I use it as not 
just for somebody who's I respect, but for somebody who has a lot of knowledge. Mm. So, for example, in the music industry, we use this term a lot. Um, for example, uh, I've done some quite um, big shows with orchestras, big as in like a lot of musicians at the same time. And there might be like 30, 40 people on stage. And so there's a lot of sound engineers, light engineers, there's a conductor, there's other musicians. I'm on stage myself. And so there's a lot of Lao Shers because, and I use that word because they have, a lot of people have very specific different knowledge and we rely on them for it. So, and I actually think that that is the same as a teacher in essence, because a teacher is the same, right? They have knowledge. There's a difference in that you specifically go to them to learn from them, but I think there's some similarities there. Maybe I'm translating it wrong, but for me, that's how it is. And I guess maybe in the English language, we could translate it to teacher directly um, in certain contexts, but we would never use that word. Oh, I totally see what you're talking about. Actually, for our profession, we do that as well. We call 摄像老师, that's the cameraman, the camera crew. And we would call, for example, 化妆老师, that's the uh, yeah. makeup artist. Yeah, that's that's what you do. And especially when you're hosting a major event, it's possible that you guys are only together for this one or two days, but you are working on this major project. It's impossible to know everybody's name and addressing them as <laughs> right, their profession right, yeah. is a little bit impolite if you just say it's just a little bit bossy and impolite so instead you say ah so the camera crew make sure you notice this it's important for your work and it's respectful mm -hmm. it's professional and it's convenient very important but mm -hmm. definitely in china we also address people with their professional titles uh especially if it's doctor if it's sometimes in a setting that's they're the director of a place or if they're the manager of a place we would use their professional titles as well. But I feel like both their professional titles and the term 老师 can also be used in a joking way. For example, if I started to call Ding Heng, Ding Heng 老师, he would know I'm teasing him. Yeah, we are trying to create a humorous atmosphere between you and me. Yeah, and yeah that would be nice, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that kind of... Um, Interaction. Uh, yeah, interaction <laughs> and atmosphere. And calling people Lao Shi is really a practice that is deeply rooted in mm. our history. You can date back to ancient dynasties as early as the spring and autumn periods or the warring state periods. We are talking about hundreds of years before Christ. Mm. And then, I guess, later in the dynasties like Jing in the 13th or 12th century, this uh, word Lao Shi started to refer to the profession of educators. But really, I think the real generalization of this title was more of the contemporary thing. In 1996, the revised edition of the Modern Chinese Dictionary defined Lao Shi as a honorific term for a person who are doing teaching and it can be generally referred to a person who is worth learning from in some way and interestingly last year there was a survey conducted in the eastern chinese city of jinan in shandong province where 80 percent of the respondents believe that everyone can be called a lao shi ah. no matter when it's asking for directions or buying food at marketplaces, <laughs> or whatever purposes. Lao Shi is always the first choice. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> That's really interesting. So I was wondering, because China is a vast country, and there are many differences, even in detail, that about different issues. So when it comes to calling someone Lao Shi, do we see any geological differences? Yeah, so I think earlier I mentioned mm. about Jinan, yeah. and that's really because Jinan is the regional capital or the provincial capital of Shandong province. And if you remember, we need to keep in mind the culture of Shandong is deeply influenced by this Confucius ideologies and a social norm of respecting teachers and emphasizing education or imparting knowledge to other people, learning from each other, is maybe relatively stronger compared to other provinces. Yeah. That's my wild guess. So that's why also this term Lao Shi can be so 
predominant in the city of Jinan. Yeah, because for my hometown, Shanxi province, in the provincial capital Taiyuan, I don't recall people calling each other 老师 on the street. Maybe we still do it in a professional setting, but if you're asking for direction on road, you would call them 大姐, so bigger sister, or sometimes you call them 师父, that's like a respectful way of addressing someone with a certain age. Mm. That, that happens more often, so I feel like definitely there would be distinctions when it comes to different places yeah. and when you're in that city no matter which city you're touring you're visiting maybe you can observe these kind of trends and these kind of social norms and um, having a little bit of record of how people address each other on the streets in different cities could be a fun survey to do mm. and there you have it the word teacher or 老师 has traveled a long way from its ancient origins to its current status as a term of respect for virtually anyone with expertise at least. And I believe it's a reminder that respect and knowledge aren't confined to classrooms. Next time, when someone calls you a teacher, take it as a compliment. It's a nod to your skills and the value you bring to the table. You're listening to Roundtable. Coming up next, let's bite into the delicious piece of tea, tea and bread and see how this trend in China combines traditional Chinese medicine with modern baking. Stay tuned. Looking for passion? How about fiery debate? Want to hear about current events in China from different perspectives? Then tune in to Roundtable, where East meets West and understanding is the goal. It's the hour of Roundtable with myself, Neil Honglin, Josh Cotterell, and Ding Heng. In an era where health and wellness take center stage, the emergence of medicinal bread offers a unique perspective on integrating traditional Chinese medicine into modern diets. From Beijing's bustling CBD to cities like Shenzhen and Hangzhou, these bakeries are reimagining how we consume TCM ingredients. So tell us more about this TCM bread. Well, this is indeed uh, something very, very interesting. The idea <laughs> is that you add some ingredients or materials that can be used in the making of traditional Chinese medicine into bakery, into bread making process. So this is not bread with traditional Chinese medicine per se. Instead, this is bread with traditional Chinese medicinal materials mm. or ingredients. And by the way, in addition to being used in the making of medicines, many of these materials and ingredients can actually serve as food as well. This is officially recognized by Chinese authorities. Uh, wolfberry or goji berry is a typical example in this regard. It can be used for medicinal purposes, but in the meantime, it is also a source of food, mm. right? And also it's interesting to note that in addition to many of those so-called professional bakeries uh, across the streets in cities, some professional hospitals, for example, I have noticed a hospital in a nearby city of Tianjin, they are also making and selling these products. So yeah, the reason behind it could be multifaceted and we can talk about that later. Yes, yes. So Josh, for your taste, would you consume some of these TCM bread? Are you interested in the idea or are you intrigued by this idea? Um, I'm not particularly intrigued by it, to be honest. Um, I mean, I come from a country that has a, a real bread eating culture. You know, I, I would even say that it's probably our second staple after potatoes, maybe, or maybe maybe on a par with them, depending on the family you're from. So we have a long history of baking. And so uh, some of these things seem quite interesting to me, but not particularly interesting, especially the sort of herbal infused breads. That sounds a little bit strange to me. But things with fruits in them and stuff like this do, do interest me, actually. I know that like goji berries mm. and things like dates. I know that there's a lot of value placed in things like dates in TCM, right? And this um, can also be in some of the breads. That sounds reasonably appealing to me. And we also have a lot of breads in 
in my own country that have berries and stuff like this as well. So um, I, I think uh, it depends on the style, but some of the more herbal infused ones do sound a little bit strange to me. I love olive bread. I don't think olives are really used in TCM, right? But um, not so much, but uh, if they were, then I would definitely eat it. <laughs> well, the idea about TCM bread is that for a lot of people, having a little bit of TCM ingredient, I'm calling them ingredient, or actually their herbal medicine, is good for your health. And as Chinese people, we are quite familiar with the concept. We're quite familiar with different functions of these herbal medicine. And uh, we are already somehow drinking the herbal tea in a way to cultivate our health. And knowing, having this correlation between a certain type of traditional Chinese herbal medicine and a certain function make you feel like if you add it to anything, it would be a good boost to your health. You add it in maybe a dish of chicken soup, it might be really good for you. You add it into a certain type of herbal tea, maybe it can help you gain more strength and be more focused in the long term, for sure. And having, for example, a mai dong toast supposedly it will be good for your lung and respiratory system and maybe having a jiao soft bread jiao being the donkey hide gelatin this soft bread um you feel like maybe having it for a longer period of time it can improve your blood circulation boost energy and enhance skin health so actually it's the correlation between the certain type of herbal ingredient and the certain function make you feel like if you add it to anything the anything would be good for your health yeah, that's interesting observation. And by the way, uh, more often than not, these kind of um, breads or toasts we are talking about here, they are pretty tasty yeah. according to people who have tried them, which is different from some people's initial imagination or expectation that, oh, maybe they smell not good. Maybe they feature the smell of the medicine. medicine. <laughs> no, that's not the case. They... They smell good, they taste good, they are tasty. So although medicinal material or TCM is a selling point of these products, that's for sure, but ultimately, they still need to win the hearts of consumers through providing of a good taste. So, oh yeah, we want them all. We want them to be tasty, we want them to be sugar-free, and we want them to be super healthy. <laughs> yeah, so we are really talking about something that is sad to be good for your health, but at the same time tasty. I'm not sure whether that can really be the reality or it is just a, a kind of illusion that somehow you can get both health and a taste from a same category of product. I'm I, not sure. I smell spectism. You don't believe in it, do you, Ding Heng? <laughs> I'm skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I get where you're from because for a certain medicine to actually have function to the status of your health, it takes time. It takes certain amount to mm -hmm. be consumed by you maybe every day for at least a um, year but definitely there is this tradition or there is this history or culture of traditional Chinese medicine being integrated with food we have the yao shan being the kind of meal with certain TCM ingredient or TCM medicine in it but most of these for them to actually work for a patient these need to be customized and and a TCM doctor would have to see you and give you diagnosis and actually provide subscription of these kind of food recipe. They seem like recipe, but actually they are basically prescription. That has been the case previously in ancient China, I'm sure. And maybe that has also contributed to people's enthusiast or interest in trying some of these TCM integrated bread. And actually, this is not the first time the market has seen these kind of products it has something to do with TCM, is it? Not really. I think, yeah, we have seen some TCM relevant or TCM featured tea drinks in some restaurants, some of the recipes, some of the dishes they provide also would feature some TCM ingredients. 
So I feel like, in a bigger picture sense, the emergence of these products, be it toast, bread, or other things we have so far talked about, this is really a reflection of a growing health anxiety among、mm. consumers in general. In a positive angle, we can say this is a growing awareness about health. But from an angle that is not so positive, this is anxiety, and that this idea that you expect anything you consume to be 100% healthy, that you can 100% stay away from junk food, fast food, etc. Such anxiety is really, in many ways, incubated by commercials or commercialization of virtually everything. But in, and in return, this kind of anxiety will incubate more opportunities in the commercial world.、Mm, so, in that case, Josh, do you think this is a sustainable business model? I think, to some degree, it is. And actually, I know that. If we look at the broader market of bread in China, this is also increasing, right? Or it's becoming、um, bigger, and sort of bakeries and different styles of breads. It, it's been on the rise, and we've seen some of these brands, right? They have massive queues outside the door.、Um, and one thing that is different about this industry compared to some other food industries is that bakeries, you have to buy the bread on the day. It's baked fresh that day, right? So. I I think as long as some of these ingredients and some of these TCM products that are in the bread can be sort of incorporated smoothly into the idea of baking it fresh, then I think that's good. And I think that as、um, this industry develops, customers as well will develop, and their taste for it will develop, and they'll want to know, you know, where were these, for example, where were these berries sourced from?、Um, are they the freshest berries, right? Um, what sort of customization can they have? Are they able to go to the bakery and select a lot of different kinds of breads that we know that customers these days they want personalized products? So as long as they can keep up with that demand, I, I do think that there is a market here because、um, I think that bread. The bread market is doing very well in China for now, anyway. Yeah. Well, the rise of medicinal bread in China highlights a unique fusion of traditional Chinese medicine and contemporary baking. By integrating TCM ingredients into everyday foods, these innovative bakeries are making ancient practices more accessible and appealing. While the trend may seem niche, its popularity reflects a growing consumer interest in health and wellness. Stay tuned as we continue to explore more fascinating interactions of tradition and modernity in our future episodes. And that brings us to the end of today's roundtable. Thanks to Ding Heng and Josh. Until next time, keep the conversations going and the ideas flowing. I'm Niu Honglin. Bye bye.